If you would, turn in your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. It's going to be on the screen behind me. But we are going to be concluding our Elijah and our Elisha series. And maybe today, maybe you felt this way. Maybe you've been overwhelmed in life. Maybe you felt like there's so much going on that you don't know how you're going to handle it. Maybe there's all these different things. Maybe it's financial. Maybe it comes with health. Maybe it comes with a relationship, your job. Maybe you just feel like you've been running on empty and, and you don't know what you're going to do. And you've kind of come when you have a significant need. Maybe you're in a desperate situation. Well, today I believe this passage of Scripture is going to minister to you. So if you would, like I said, turn your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. And I'm going to start reading there. And this is what it says. One day the widow of a member of the group of prophets came to Elijah and cried out, My husband who has served you is dead. And you know how he feared the Lord, but now a creditor has come, threatening to take my two sons as slaves. What can I do to help you, Elisha said. Tell me, what do you have in the house? Nothing at all except a flask of olive oil, she replied. And Elijah said, borrow as many empty jars as you can from your friends and neighbors. Then go into your house with your sons, shut the door behind you, pour olive oil from your flask into the jars, setting each aside when it is filled. So she did as she was told. Her sons kept bringing jars to her, and she filled one after another. Soon every container was full to the brim. Bring me another jar, she said to one of her sons. There aren't any more, he told her. And then the olive oil stopped flowing. When she told the man of God what happened, he said to her, now sell the olive oil and pay your debts and you and your sons can live on what is left over. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you for who you are. You are an amazing God. And Lord, we acknowledge that your Holy Spirit is in this place, God. So speak to us. Speak to us, God, in ways we never thought possible today. Show us what only you can show us. Speak things to us that only you can speak to us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, listen, some time ago, back in like 2008, I was in a desperate situation. One of our friends, there was a lot of staff here, and we had driven down um, to Roswell. And one of our friend's father had passed away. And on the way down, uh, my friend Greg Butler, he, he drove on the way down, and then on the way back, I was going to take over and drive. Now, we had a lot of people with us. There was probably six or seven people, and Pastor Daniel was one of those people. And when I remember getting back in the car, and I was getting ready, and we were driving back, and we were coming on the road in between Roswell and Vaughn, and I was driving, and I, I, I forgot that when I got in the car, I forgot to look at the gas gauge. And so I looked down at the gas gauge, and we are on E. Like, we're on the red line, and there's still, like, 30 miles to Vaughn. And so I, like, I needed to prepare the, the whole bus or the whole van of people, and I was like, hey, we're going to run out of gas. And they were like, ha, 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 you're kidding, right? And I'm like, no, we're going to run out of gas. And so we're going, and I'm praying. I'm pleading with God. I'm like, God, please, God. Let our, let just give us supernatural gas. Let us keep going, God. Come on, please, God. And then, and I said, and then everybody else in the car, they started praying too. They started laying hands on the car and praying. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the gas gauge started cranking up. And we made it all the way to Vaughn. In God good? Yeah, that did not happen. That's a bunch of bull. We ran out of gas and we got stranded on the side of the road. <laughs> That's what happened. We got stranded. And it was like, what are we going to do now? We're like 15 miles from Vaughn and we're broke down. But I think sometimes we read this passage and we think that's how God works. And I'm going to pray and God's going to supernaturally give us this or that. There's going to be magic money that appears in my account. That's how we believe, right? Because, man, and, and here's the thing that, that I think is important. While God did not provide more gas in the tank, he did provide something else because at that time we decided, okay, we have to hitchhike. And so we throw the thumbs up and at that time there happens to be a judge and his wife from Texas driving through. They're on their way to Santa Fe for vacation. Now, if you wanna get in the car with somebody, you don't wanna get in with random people, but we got in the car with a judge from Texas. America, God's country, right? 
And this is what I'm saying to you is God provided that judge in that very moment to get us from there to Vaughn. And not only did that judge get us the ride there, he also went and flagged us down another ride to take us back to our car. And so we got our gas and we went back and, and these farmers took us back and we were driving in the big dually truck and there's lots of flies in there. And I was thinking to myself, I'm like, this is awesome. I have never hitchhiked before. This is such a great adventure. Because I'm like... I'm like 24 years old. I'm like, this is, this is so cool. I'm a hitchhiker. Um, and then Pastor Daniel, though, he was the one who went with me while everybody else stayed in the bus. And this shows you how different our personalities are. He was sitting there when we were with the farmers. He was thinking, okay, if these guys do anything crazy, I'm going to punch this one in the throat. I'm going to push Craig out the car, and I'm going to dive out after him. So that shows you how different our perception was. But God didn't, God didn't provide supernatural gas in the tank, but he did provide everything we needed. We just had to do our part, and that was go ask for the ride. See, sometimes you could get there and be like, what do we do, what do we do, what do we do? And panic. Or you can do your part and expect God to do his part. And that's a big theme we've been talking about through this entire sermon series. And sometimes I think we get caught up and we're in a desperate situation in life and we think, God, you gotta help me, God, you gotta help me, God, you gotta help me. And we're expecting him to do magic. But the reality is that God is not your genie and he does not grant your wishes. And so what happens is we see a lot in this, there's a lot we can learn right here in, in this small seven verses of scripture that I think is so important. These first two verses, the first thing you'll notice is we have this poor widow. We don't know her name, we don't know who she is. What we do know, is, or at least Jewish tradition might suggest that it is Obadiah's um, wife. Now Obadiah was a prophet who during the time of Elijah was protecting all kinds of other prophets. He was hiding prophets because they were being so persecuted. And so that would make sense because he would have had to spend all his resources protecting uh, those prophets. And so there was nothing left. And now maybe it's not Obadiah's wife. Even if it's not, she's still, the, at that time, prophets would have been spending a lot of their resources. A lot of times they would have been on the run. There would have not been readily available jobs to them. And so she's come and her husband has died. And there's not much she can do about it because there's not a lot of opportunity for women. Because at that time, women, they weren't considered uh, a viable part of the workforce. And, and so her husband is gone, so what does she do? She has debts, and now these creditors are coming to collect their debts. And what they want to do is they want to take her two sons, because it's like, well, you can't pay your debt, so what we're going to do is we're going to take your two sons as slaves and make them work off your debt. Now, I don't know about you, but if you said, it depends on the day, I'll take one of your kids and we'll pay off your student loans, depending on the day, depending on the kid, <laughs> might be worth it, right? I'm just being real. I'm kidding. I would never trade my kids to pay off my debts. I'm kidding. Mostly. <laughs> if you have four kids, you know. Uh, and, and nobody like, I can't, I can't believe he said that. If you had four kids, you'd know. You'd know. But anyway, so this is what's happening. And she is in a desperate situation, and, and, and she doesn't see her way out, right? It puts things into perspective, especially when it comes to, like, sometimes how we get upset, right? We're at Walmart. We're waiting in line, and the person in front of us at the self-checkout is checking out nothing but produce and vegetables, and they're having to look up every item, and we're standing there for 45 minutes, and we're like, what is going on? No, that's not how you do it. Don't you know the code for bananas already? Um, <laughs> and you get mad and you get upset. How many of you get mad when your phone is slow and you don't have cell phone service? Anybody here get mad? Yeah, I get really mad. I'm like, well, I pay for this thing to work. Why is it not working? I get upset when the Wi-Fi is not working. But those are all first world problems, right? <laughs> Level one problems. But you got to put things into perspective because this is what she's dealing with is a graduate level problem. And some of you today are dealing with graduate level problems. You're dealing with real issues and real things in your life that you don't know how you're going to get out of. You see things in front of you and you're like, well, I don't know why. God, this doesn't make sense. I have nothing. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Maybe it's a financial situation and the pressure of your finances is coming in so hard. And you feel like you're being strangled and suffocated. Maybe it's a relationship you're in. 
Maybe you need to get out and you don't know how you're gonna get out of it. Maybe it's your marriage and your marriage has ended. Maybe you've been betrayed by someone you trusted and they've betrayed you and now your trust is broken and, and it's caused all kinds of other issues for you. These are graduate level problems. These are real issues. And many of us have these issues. And so we deal with these things and they're real and they come. And this is what I want you to understand. When you're in your most desperate, when you are in your most desperate time of need, when you look around and you think, I don't see a way out, that's when you're gonna discover that God is what you really need. You see, this woman is in significant need and she expresses her need to the pro prophet. She doesn't see a way out. She expresses her need to the prophet. And what does the prophet do? He says, how can I help you? How can I help you? Now, I, I wanna take a, just a little rabbit trail here. Listen, if somebody approaches you with a problem, say, how can I help you? If you wanna be like Christ, you present yourself to help people. You put yourself in situations to help people. You wanna help people, you wanna make a difference in somebody's life, place yourself in a position to help people. And I wanna tell you something. That's not easy for me, or at least it wasn't easy for me. Back in the day, small talk, talking with people, having conversations with people, that was the worst thing. That's my nemesis, I don't like it, I don't wanna be a part of it. And it would really get me worked up. I used to have to go in the bathroom back here, look in the mirror, give myself a 10 minute pep talk before I come out here and leave worship. I used to have to do the same thing before I walked through the foyer, the foyer was the worst. And here's the thing, sometimes you might say to yourself, man, I can't do that, I can't present myself to you, I don't know what to say, I don't know what to do, I don't have all the answers. But Pastor Steve used to say this thing, he used to say this all the time, he used to say, he who shows himself friendly will have friends. He who shows himself friendly will have friends. So you know what I decided I'll start doing? I'll start putting myself right in the middle of the foyer where everybody walks out so I can just start shaking hands. So I started shaking hands left and right. And let me tell you something, today my favorite thing to do is shake hands in the foyer. And let me tell you, because I presented myself out there, people stop me all the time and they're like, hey, Craig, can you pray for me? I got this going on. Hey, Craig, can you pray for me? I've got this going on in my life. And sometimes people come, just the other day, somebody come and presented me with a problem. It was huge. It was a graduate level problem and I didn't have the answers, but I was like, hey, listen, I'm gonna pray with you and then I'm gonna connect you with so-and-so because they have experience in this area and maybe they can help you and guide you in the right steps. And this is what I'm gonna to say to you. If you wanna be like Christ, you're gonna to have to put yourselves in places that make you uncomfortable, but you're gonna to have to present yourself to be used by God. If you wanna help people, you wanna make a difference, you gotta put yourself out there. It's no good just to be like, hey, or to think, man, I'm too scared. It's just not me, it's not my personality. See, your personality's changed. Back in the day, I would've loved to play guitar and play bass, and a couple of months ago, I would schedule myself and put myself back up here to play guitar and play bass again. But what I realized is I wasn't being able to get out there and shake hands with people. So I took myself back off the schedule so I could be out there to shake hands with people. Because I wanna be out there to present myself to help you. Anybody can play guitar. There's lots of good guitar players. So you have to be, if you're at work, somebody's like, man, I got migraine headaches or this is going on with my life. Let me give you the answer. How can I help you? Maybe all you got is a prayer, but believe God will take that prayer and do something supernatural with it. So then she comes in and she says, how can, he says, how can I help you? And he treats her with such dignity and respect. And he says something to her that is very, very profound. He says, tell me, what do you have in your house? He doesn't say, I'm here with all the answers, but he respects her dignity and he says, let's start with what you have and let God meet your needs through what you have. And so why does she do? How does she reply? She says, your servant has nothing. There's nothing in my house. There's just some olive oil and I'm going to use that. I need that. I got to live off that. There's nothing, now how many of you know, maybe, men in here, men in here, maybe you know a woman. Maybe you know a woman, I'm, and, and sometimes she's got somewhere important to go. 
And so she goes into her closet. And she begins to look across her entire closet, which I, it might be third, three quarters of the closet is hers. You can clothe a small country. Maybe you know somebody like this. And they just flip through. I've got nothing to wear. <laughs> maybe you know a woman. I don't know that I know a woman like that, but maybe you know a woman like that. <laughs> but you look through there, and here's the thing that I want to point out. Sometimes in your greatest time of need, in your most desperate moment, all you can see is what you don't have. And you can't see what you really have. Because you're, 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 you're desperate. And you're looking, but what do I do? Like, it's like when we ran out of gas, we could have sat there and been like, what do I do? What do I do? Cell phone service is not working. What do I do? What do I do? But we had, to, we had to make a plan. We had to do what we could do. And so many times we're looking around, and, and, and it's interesting that when you're hurting and when you're lacking, sometimes all you can see is what you don't have. And you miss the blessings that you do have. See, when we get down and we're depressed and we're hurting and we're just consumed, at that moment, we're just consumed with what we don't have. It's like maybe you know a woman who has enough clothes to clothe a small country, but yet she can't find a single thing to wear to a dinner. Maybe you know her. <laughs> But the reality is this, is when you're in these situations, you have to stop focusing on what you don't have and start working with what you do have. Because what she said, see, sometimes we look and we start despising what's in our house. But Tommy Barnett would say it this way. He would say, the miracle is in your house. And see, so many times she was looking, she was thinking, oh, this, I just have olive oil. Oh, I gotta use that. That's gonna be just, a, I gotta cook with it. I gotta, I gotta do all these different things with it. That's all I have. And I'm gonna use it and soon it'll be gone. I've got nothing. But here's the reality. Back in that time, olive oil was a very valuable thing. Like I said, you cooked with it. You used it as moisturizer. You couldn't just go down to Bath and Body Works back then. <laughs> Didn't work out that way. I used it to cook with, used it to burn for the lamps to light your house. There was no electricity, so you needed things like that. They were essential. And so sometimes it's that thing that you look at that you think, oh man, it's not that big of a deal. Oh, that talent, that's nothing. What can I do with that? I can't really use that for God, or I can't really use this to, to help. Let me tell you something. There are so many opportunities available to you. I mean, People make money filming their lives. I'm just being real with you. Whatever you have, God's wanting you to take a self-evaluation and say, what is in your house? And it might just be that thing you think, all I've got is this. It's nothing that God will do something incredible with. Because we serve a God who does big things with little things. See, all through scripture, you see it again and again. What did Jesus do? He took five loaves and two fish and he broke them and he fed 5,000 people and they still had food left over. Andrew was like, what can we do with this many people and just five loaves and two fish? But in the hands of God, it was something amazing. But somebody had to bring those two, lives, those two, those two fish and five loaves Somebody had to bring those. If they didn't bring them because they thought it's worthless, it doesn't matter, that'll never feed anybody, then it would have never happened. See, God can do a lot with a little. Think about David and Goliath. There's this giant, and this guy's gonna go with no armor, and he's gonna go out there, and he's gonna take a sling and five smooth stones, and what, he's gonna defeat this giant? But that's exactly what he did. God asked Moses, what's in your hand? And he had a rod. A shepherd's staff. God said, go and use that. You see, God does a lot 
with a little. So we have to stop focusing on what we don't have and stop, start working with what you do because God has given you everything you need to do everything he wants you to do. See, so many say we can't because we don't. I can't do this because I don't have this. I can't do this because it's not like this. I mean, if I had what this guy had, then man, then I could do those things. Or if I had what she had, then I could do those things. But I don't have what they have. See, but the reality is that limitations are often the thing that gives us our greatest innovation. I mean, when I think about being creative, if somebody says, go write, and I'm like, okay, what do you want me to write about? Write about anything. That's the worst scenario to be in. Because I can write about anything. Okay, well, I got 40 million topics. How do I narrow it down now? But if somebody says, go write about grace, then fine, I can write about grace all day long. It's those limitations that can be the greatest source of innovation. And sometimes we're looking at it, well, I can't do this because if I was like this, or if I had this, or if I had that. If I had what they have. But listen, you know, that's not a biblical principle. God doesn't care where you start. He only cares about what you use and how you use it. Only that you use what you have. See, but the world wants to tell you, well, your limitations are the problem. That's what's stopping you from being a success, right? So man, if we could just make everybody equal, then it would all be good, right? If that's the case, then, then the stimulus would have worked. But it didn't, because the reality is this, is that if, if, you, if, if you can't be faithful with a little, you'll never be faithful with a lot. If you can't be trusted with a little bit, you can never be trusted with a lot. Well, we'll just make everybody equal and it'll all be good. No, because the same people who, who, who would spend their little bit on all the wrong things will still spend their lot on all the wrong things. The world wants to push it. They want to push socialism on us. But do you know socialism, nothing that, God is anti-socialism. Jesus is anti-socialism. You're going to hear it said the other way, but he is anti all those things. Think about the parable of the talents and it settles it all. Because if this was, if the world, then everybody would have said, oh man, that guy who started with only one, that poor guy. But what did God do? See, that poor guy wasn't even faithful with the one thing. And so what did God do? He took the one thing away from him and he gave it to the guy who had 10. See, the world would say, well, the guy has 10. He doesn't need more. But the difference is, is God could trust that guy to do so many great things with the 10 and now the 11. That's why the Bible says, he who has will have more and he who doesn't, even what he has will be taken away. The question is, what do you have in your house? What do you have in your house? Willie George would say it this way, what are you doing with your sixth day? He would say, okay, listen, you work five days a week. You work Monday through Friday. But what are you doing with that sixth day? How are you helping? Because God didn't work five days a week. God worked seven days, I mean six days. He took the seventh day to rest. So what are you doing with your sixth day? What are you doing with your extra time? I'm in this situation, I'm desperate, I don't got anything, what do I do, what do I do, what do I do? You take an evaluation of what you have, and maybe you can't figure it out, maybe you, you need fresh eyes, so you need to go to somebody and say, hey man, can you look at my life and tell me what I have that I can use to make my life better? Maybe you're bad with finances and you keep going in the wrong direction. Maybe you need to humble yourself, show somebody where you're spending all your money, who's smart with money, and they can look at it and say, well listen, you need to cut this out, you need to cut this out, and then you need to cut this out, and now guess what, you have an extra $300 a month. Have you ever evaluated how much money you spend on Starbucks? <laughs> I don't want to think about it. I'm asking you today, what is in your house? What is in your house? Because here's the thing, we offer God what we have and trust him to give us what we need. We offer him what we have and we trust him to give us what we need. I had to hitchhike a ride, but I had to trust God to keep me protected on that ride and take me to the right place, and he did. 
So what happens is, is she gets all her jars together. She goes in the house and they close the door behind them. Let me tell you this, when you're in a desperate time, get people around you who are gonna build you up, who are not gonna tear you down. Don't let people come into your room if they're gonna say, well, I don't think this is gonna work. I don't know how this is gonna work, guys. I don't know how you're gonna get out of this. Get those people out of your life. Get people who are like, I'm gonna believe with you that God's gonna do something for you and he's gonna change your life in this moment. So let's go. I'm gonna agree with you in faith. And so that's what they do. And they bring all these jars. They go borrow jars from all around. And she starts pouring it in, pouring it in, and it keeps going. Magically, not magically, supernaturally, God did it. It keeps going and going and going till what? Till she has no more jars. Now, let me tell you, this is why it's important that when you go for God, you go big. Because she, what if she only got a few jars? What if she only got a jars, but she expected God to do something? She did her part, she was obedient, and she expected God to do something amazing. Sometimes we look at our life, and we look at these things and we say, ah, oh, yeah, but that's not gonna work. Well, this, here's the reason that can't work, or here's why that's not gonna work. That's just this little old thing, so I'll try, but we'll see. That's just a victim mentality. I'm a victim because this it's not work. I don't have what they have. I don't have what he has. And listen, that's not Christ, because if you're in Christ, you're a victor, not a victim. You cannot serve God. You can't really have Christ in you and be a victim mentality. So if you're sitting here saying, I can't, I can't, I don't know how it's gonna work, you need to reevaluate your life because you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you, like Pastor Steve talked about on Wednesday. So you can get through, you can get through even when it's not going good because the thing that you're gonna see, the thing that you're gonna see is this whole time what you really needed when you're in your most desperate moment, what you really needed when you are looking for something is Christ. Because it's Christ that sustains you. It's Christ that gives you victory. It's Christ that does it all. So when you're having to go through tough times, you're like, how am I gonna make it? It's Christ that gives you the strength to keep going through those tough and hard times. It's Christ that motivates you and encourages you to say, okay, what's in my house? What do I have? I may not have this. I may not have that. I may not have what he has. I may not have what she has. But what do I have that I can use and let God multiply it? Because it's in those moments when you put your focus and you start saying, okay, this is what I have, this is what I'm gonna do, and I'm gonna be responsible with what I have. I'm gonna be faithful with what I have. That's when God multiplies it. That's when he pours out a blessing on your life that you can't contain. And it's not before that. Sometimes we wonder, man, I can't get my finances in line, but the problem is, is you're not tithing and you're spending it on things that don't matter. And if you can't be faithful with a little, how will you ever be faithful with a lot? God loves you, and he wants the best for you. And that's what I'm saying. When you're in your most desperate hour, you search for things, but the reality is, is while you're searching, while you're crying out for all those things, the thing you really need, the thing you're really searching for is Jesus. Because it's the only thing that satisfies your soul. It's the only thing that truly meets your needs. At some point in our lives, we have to stop waiting for what we want and start going and getting a bunch of jars. You have to flip your attitude you have to flip your heart. You have to start saying, well, I want this, I need this. How do I get this? I don't know how I'm ever gonna get this. And at some point, you just have to step out and start getting jars, empty jars that you're ready to fill. And at some point in your own life, you have to empty out your own life. You have to empty out all these things that catch you up, that you trip over, so many times so that you can let God fill you up.
In 2 Corinthians verse, chapter 4, verse 7, it says, it says, but we have this treasure, which is Christ. And it says, what do we have it in? In jars of clay. And it's talking about you and me. We're those jars of clay. And we have to make our lives empty so that there's room for God. Sometimes we hold on to things, hurts and pains and, and, and sins and different things that we get caught up in. We have to empty our life of those things and let God be the thing that fills us up because as Steve even said this on Wednesday night, he was talking about oil and how oil represents the Holy Spirit. He wants to fill you with the Holy Spirit. God wants to change your life. But you have to be open and willing for that to happen. He's not going to force himself into your life. He's not going to come busting through the doors. You have to empty out your life, empty out your jar so that he can fill it up. And sometimes we wonder why well, uh, this has not been working for me. This is not happening for me. It's because you're not making room for God. because you're not making room for God. When you don't have what you want, what you're going to find out is that Christ is all you need. So this is what I want you to do today. I want you to take an evaluation of your life. I want you to look in and say, what's in my house? What has God given me that I should be using for him? And I'm not saying it's everybody that, it's not even just people who are in a desperate situation. It's everybody. Everybody has something in their house that they should be using for God and multiplying for God. You ever wonder why you see some people and they have so much and they just keep getting more and more? It's because they're using what they have. So for everybody in here, what's in your house? What should you be using for God? How, because God's given you everything you need. So what's in your house? For others of you, maybe you never made Jesus Lord of your life. You never surrendered to him. Maybe some of you, you knew God, but you walked away. And here's the reality. You've got so many other things in your jar that there's no room for God. And it's time to empty it out. Because God wants to do something in your life, but you've got to make room. You keep wondering why you keep going in this cycle and you keep doing the same things over and over again. It's because you haven't made room for God. You keep searching and you keep searching and you find something for a little while and it fulfills you for a moment and then it's gone and then you're right back where you started. Because here's the reality. All you really need, all you're really in search of, what you really need is Christ. You see people... And they go through horrible situations. A spouse dies or, or all these different things. But you see them and they're still faithful. You know why they're able to still be faithful? You know why they're able to still keep going? Because Christ gives them strength to keep going in that horrible time. And it's not easy. I'm sure if you talk to any of them, they would tell you it's not e easy. And that they still hurt and they still break down. And they have horrible days. but they keep going because it's Christ that's motivating them to move forward. So listen, with every head bowed and every eye closed, no one looking around, I don't want to call you out. I don't want to embarrass you, but I want to know today, if you say, Craig, I don't know Jesus. I've been trying to fill my life up. I've been trying to fill my jar up with all these other things, but I need to get those things out and I need to make room for God today. Maybe others of you, you knew God, but like I said, you walked away. And you need to make Jesus Lord of your life again today. You need to come back and surrender to him and get rid of these other things that have been filling up your jar. If that's you today, I don't want to call you out. I don't want to embarrass you, but I do want to know who I'm praying with. So if you say, Craig, I need to make Jesus Lord of my life. I need to surrender to him today. I need a change. I'm searching for something, and Jesus is the answer. If that's you today, you say, I need to make Jesus Lord of my life. If that's you, if you're anywhere in here, would you put your hand up right now? If there's anybody in here, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. 
As I look across the bottom, is there anybody else? Thank you very much. Thank you over here. Thank you very much. As I look across the top, is there anybody up there? He says, thank you very much. I see that hand. Thank you very much. I saw that other hand. Thank you, thank you. Listen, I want you to know God loves you. He's here for you, and he will see you through any circumstance or any situation you are in. And the Bible says no one can come to God unless the Holy Spirit draws in. So I want to tell you, if you're sitting there and you feel like, man, I should raise my hand, that's the Holy Spirit talking to you. So one last time, is there anybody else who says, Craig, I need to, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you up there. I see your hand at the top. Thank you back there. Thank you. I see your hands. Thank you. Thank you over there. I see it. So many hands. Man, listen, God loves you. And listen, if you raise your hand, thank you very much. And if you raise your hand, I want you to repeat this prayer after me. And if you didn't raise your hand, I want you to repeat this prayer in support of those who did. Would you say, Father, I come to you now. I surrender all that I am to you. I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord. I repent of my sins. And I turn to you, and I run after you for the rest of my days. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen.